Good evening, everyone. I would love to keep this a little bit more informal. So like Sarah mentioned, if you do have a question during the presentation at any point, feel free to throw your hand up and we'll bring the mic over. Um, and we'll keep this going. So if there's any questions at all, you want to talk about your startup, we'll do that towards the end as well. Uh, but I'd love to hear about all of that. <clears throat> but before I go into it, just to give you a little bit of my background and this space, so it gives you some context for the presentation before. Uh, graduated from Stern in 2011, uh, spent some time in finance, wasn't a huge fan of it. Worked in startups for a while. We worked at a place called Charity Water, which I can tell you a little about as we size things out. Uh, launched a startup, we raised around the financing for it, which will give context for how, why we're doing this. But now I'm sitting in the Entrepreneurial Institute as part of the Innovation Venture Fund leading technology investments. So in that role, I'm seeing deck after deck after deck uh, and seeing how founders are presenting their market and the competition that they're working with. Uh, so that'll be some context as we go through this presentation on what I think is more important, less important, and how you guys can position and talk about your ideas as well. Uh, so as Sarah mentioned, the fund is one piece of the Entrepreneurial Institute, so there's a lot of other programs and resources that are going on here. So feel free to come up to me after or email me and we can set up time to chat too. Uh, so I thought one thing before we get started also is that when you are positioning your market and your market size and you're thinking about being a venture, uh, being a founder of a venture, I'm going to bring this up several times kind of throughout the presentation so you'll probably get sick of it towards the end. But what's really important every single time I meet founders or when I was pitching my own venture is that you want to become a thought leader in the space that you're operating in. It can't just be hyper-focused on your venture and how it fits into your life and the general landscape, but I think it's really important to develop an understanding of what is going on in the indirect competitors, what's going on in adjacent markets, where do you see your entire industry heading in five to ten years, not just within the next year, um, and talking about the evolution of your product and your market as a whole and then finding out where the hockey puck is going to go and how your venture fits in that equation. So I'll bring that up several times, but a lot of that, speaking about the market and the competition, is going to be based off of that. I thought an interesting place to start was with this image, uh, because many of us, when we think about our ventures, we often think about what happens if Google, Facebook, Amazon, or Apple end up building the same exact thing. And while that is a valid concern, it's not valid enough for you not to build your, your, your venture and be obsessed with what the competitors are doing. You should have a general understanding of them, but there's several advantages of being the smaller venture in the space. That's why seed funds, pre-seed funds, Series A funds exist, so that you can continue to disrupt the bigger players. The advantages of being smaller are you can move a lot faster. Right? You can be s closer and stay close to the ground in terms of what your customers want and what problems they're facing. Right? If the, the CEOs of these big companies are several layers now in between the customer and them, so they don't always have the ability to proactively change their product or change their venture accordingly. Uh, so you can move faster. The larger players have reputational risk. We've seen that with several big startups now. I won't name the names, but they have a lot of reputational risk in terms of the direction that they've decided to take their companies in and risks that they've taken. So there's not an advantage of always being the first mover in a certain space. You can learn from the mistakes that the incumbents have made in the past. Uh, and you also have the luxury of learning from what mistakes or missteps they've made. The other thing that you should be aware of is who are the customers, the stakeholders, the investors, the, uh, the patterns of recognition that are going on with these ventures, and are they actually willing to go into new markets or explore new strategies that you might be considering? Uh, because, because of that reputational risk, because of that customer risk, and because of cannibalization of their current products, they might not want to go into those areas. Uh, so the name of the game is disruption. So when you're looking at your bigger competitors, you can easily topple them. Uh, we've seen that with Uber and Lyft taking on the New York City Taxi Limousine Commission. We've seen it with Amazon and the current state of retail. You've seen it with Netflix and Blockbuster. And you've seen it with HomeAway and traditional hospitality brands, which were then also, again, disrupted by Airbnb. So again, don't be discouraged by the larger players. This is a framework. I know this... Uh, might not be so relevant when you guys are founders and thinking in terms of frameworks and, and, and the business school curriculum, but this is something interesting that you guys should think about. When you are a venture, you have a new venture, you have a couple of different options on how you position yourselves. Right? So you can target the whole industry and go industry-wide, 
uh, and try to find a solution that's going to cater towards every single customer in the entire industry. Uh, you can go off of a particular segment only and focus on that specific niche. And while you do that, you can focus on becoming the cost leader and developing a cost advantage over other competitors or the uniqueness in value and the value proposition that you're offering your customer. But as a startup and as a venture, unless any of you are millionaires in the audience, you generally have limited scale and limited resources. So one thing that we work on with founders that come through here is what is that specific niche that they should focus in on. So the area in the quadrant that you're going to be most likely playing in where you can provide unique value to that underserved market is in that bottom left-hand quadrant of offering one particular segment uh, a unique value and solving the needs of one specific customer. To go off of this framework for a second, one big problem that we see with founders when they come in and they speak about their market size, and this is something else I'm going to touch on a lot throughout today, is that they come in and say, we are solving the needs for every millennial between the ages of 18 and 25 who are living in large metropolitan cities. That's not a customer. That's not a market that you want to be focusing on. I want to know the specific person that you're solving this problem for and what niche do they sit in and what value are you solving for them? What is that specific problem? So if I pick on someone in this audience, if I look at Alex, what problem is he facing every single day that we need to be able to solve for them? Once you solve that one problem and you figure out that unique value that you're offering them, you then scale that to multiple customers that look and feel the same exact way as Alex. Uh, so this is kind of where you're going to start operating from, just a framework to be thinking about as you're going out, is that you don't want to broaden your scope too wide and say, we're going to take on the entire, let's say you're doing food delivery, we don't want to take on the entire food delivery market and attempt to uh, disrupt the way traditional restaurants are delivering food, the way Seamless is delivering food, the way uh, Postmates or any of the other ventures that are out there right now. You want to find out what that specific niche is when you have limited scale, and then talk about a vision in the future of how you scale that up to go over the entire industry over time. But then again, looking at where the hockey puck is going. Um, so there's three steps that we'll go over today. One is knowing that initial customer and value proposition, which we talked about, developing the understanding of your markets, we've already talked about it a little bit, uh, and then how you should invest your time and resources a little bit strategically, uh, which we'll go into other startup school sessions as well. So the first one of knowing your initial customer and profile. So I just talked about this, but this is a template that we will share with you again once you filled out that survey. Uh, it's called the Customer Archetype Profile. So this one actually from Metaprop, which is a, a VC and accelerator focusing on real estate investments, came in and actually on a panel yesterday, spoke about when their founders, ones that are most successful, they have the pictures of the exact people that they're selling to posted all over their office. They print them out from LinkedIn and they know exactly who that person is. So one big mistake, again, that founders make is they don't know who that person and who that customer is that you're selling to. So if I am uh, a VR and AR company selling to digital brands, sometimes they pitch it to the creative directors and the CMOs for six months. They have limited resources. They spend through all their resources and only find out at the end that they were actually supposed to be selling to the CFO the entire time. So it's really important to figure out exactly what your customer archetype profile is. You might not have a right answer right now, but build a couple of hypotheses around that. So fill out four or five of these to start with, and then test them out over time. Go and talk to 20 or 30 or 40 of those type of people and understand if that's exactly the problem that they're facing. So some of the buckets that you would fill out over here are the jobs to be done. What are they trying to achieve by, without your solution? What are the problems that they're facing right now? What pains do they have? What existing solutions are they using in order for them to overcome that problem? And is it enough? Or are they still facing issues with that? So again, this is going to be partly based on your own hypothesis, but then also informed by dozens of interviews with people that you think are facing this problem. Um, how do they buy? And who are the barriers and kind of saboteurs before they actually purchase? So in my example of AR and VR, the creative director might be the one that wants to actually purchase the product, but is the CFO stepping in, in the way and making sure that they have the budget for it? So knowing the entire ecosystem of where you're selling into is exceptionally important as well. The describing the person, the name, the age, the relevant personal information, there's no limit to how much you can gather on those type of people. Right? You want to build up a really good sales funnel and understand what makes them tick, what are they motivated by, 
Um, how do they comprehend and use your product over time? And how can you build up some empathy with them as you're pitching to them over time? Uh, so these are some of the important things that you guys should, should be thinking about. Again, we'll send this around. So one thing we can do towards the end is we can build a couple of these based off of some, if anybody's willing to volunteer their venture, we can build some customer archetype profiles together um, and, and go through each of these buckets. I think you might have seen the business model canvas in other startup school sessions if you've been around. But the, just to quickly focus on where we're talking about today is specifically within your value propositions and your customer segments. So once you've built out your customer archetype profile, now build out what that entire customer segment looks like. Again, you might have three or four to start with. Eventually, you'll focus on one niche. But in the beginning, figure out what your customer segments are. They might be uh, NYU students uh, between the ages of 18 and 19. So uh, I guess that's freshmen and sophomores. Uh, it's uh, focusing on food delivery to the East Village by mobile phone. Uh, males, not females, whatever the focus is right now. So you want to focus on that customer segment. And then what are the value propositions that your product is offering them? And do that for each of the customer segments you've built. If then your next customer segment is females between 40 and 45 living in Midtown who work in law firms that are looking for food past 8 p.m., that's another thing that you want to build as your customer segment. And what are the value propositions that you're offering to them? So fill these two out on your business model canvas. Again, it's all hypothesis right now, and you want to build this as a science experiment, as opposed to just throwing things on the wall and hoping something sticks. So these are some things to guide and frame entrepreneurship as opposed to treating it like the wild, wild west. Uh, so use some of these tools, and we'll send this around too. Developing the understanding of your market. So this is going to fairly, I'm going to give you some tools that are very obvious, but they need to be said, uh, and some tools that maybe you haven't heard about. So feel free to ask questions or email about those after. But Again, we want to build a very deep understanding of the market. So with the venture that we are working on, the most embarrassing thing is to go into any meeting and then someone brings up, but have you thought about this venture and how they're tackling it? And then you're kind of left dumbfounded because you've never heard about it. Or, hey, did you see this in the news today about what you're, you're working on VR? Did you see about this, this company got funded? Or did you see this new technology that's come out? And again, you have no idea or no opinion about what's going on. Uh, Developing that thesis, treat it almost like you're writing a 10-page research paper. Uh, and now you need to convince someone to uh, put resources behind it. Not only investors, but even your customers. Just understanding exactly what they need and what their problem is. So the first one, just Google it the same exact way your customer would. Right? So if I am that 40 to 45-year-old female sitting in a law firm in Midtown, what would I type into Google? How do I find food in Midtown at, after 8 p.m.? Right? So see what resources come out. What other startups are offering that service at that point in time? Go to the 50th page. So on this one in 33 on Google, you're still seeing DoorDash coming up on the 33rd page. Right? So go deep down the Google funnel and see exactly who else comes up on the 7th or 8th or 9th page because I can almost guarantee it that your venture won't show up in the first page until you actually start spending a good amount of resources and effort behind the SEO. So who else is showing up in the later stages? Because that means they might be somewhere around your stage right now. And those are people that you should track. Not be obsessed with your competition, but track them and understand how they're approaching it. Uh, so things that aren't getting as many clicks. The other things that are searches related to on-demand food delivery, you can understand kind of what other people are concerned with, which leads to the, the next tool, I believe, which is search volumes and terms. So this is a really important tool. It's called the Google Keyword Tool. And you can see what types of words people are searching for. And you can see what they're bidding on. Right? So you can understand the frequency of searches, uh, what the competition for those searches are. So Chinese food delivery ranked lower, but food delivery, fast food delivery as a whole ranked higher. And because of that, ventures had to pay higher for that in order to show up in the earlier search searches. Uh, so you imagine something like Seamless, is, Seamless or Grubhub owns most of these. So how can you differentiate yourself and now show up somewhere higher up in the searches? Uh, so use the Google keyword search also just to understand kind of what your customers are looking for. Uh, you, uh, you don't. I, that was just more uh, kind of my own thoughts. Since it is fast food delivery, who owns the SEO? I'd imagine them too, somewhere up high. Right? So, yeah, 90%. Right. Um, but you can see kind of what the, how many searches are coming in for a certain area, what the competition is, and what the suggested bid is on how you kind of buy that space right now 
We can go into this a little bit deeper after as well. Uh, the, other, the other thing which you can access through NYU, uh, and I think there's several other ways to access this. This is a paid subscription, but NYU should give it to you for free. It's called Statista. Uh, I believe you have access to Statista, yeah. Yeah, I think NYU, NYU students and faculty have access to Statista. Or, and if you don't, you can go to BOPST, and I'm sure they have a lot of the similar resources there as well. Uh, but Statista will give you those white papers that I was talking about. So if you are lazy and don't want to build the white paper on your own and write it out, you can read exactly what every single other person has written about the industry in the past and start to develop your thesis accordingly. So one thing that's interesting is that when we're, as investors, and we're looking at companies, when a founder comes to us, I know that I don't know as much as they do. And I want to know that they know a lot more than I do. And I want them to make me smart. Uh, I want them to make me smart in the space. I want them to tell me where I should be reading more, what I should be looking at more. Uh, I don't want to feel like I know more than them because then I should be the one starting the company. Uh, so instead, we want to invest in their genius and their intellect. So by writing these research reports and building a brand for yourself and knowing exactly where the industry is headed and having an opinion is, again, extremely important. Uh, the, so on Statista, you can access a lot of these things. You can look at stats, which speak to how consumer trends are changing over time. You can research um, actual different topics and graphics that you can use in your decks or when you're pitching to potential customers, or even surface where areas that you might be interested in focusing in more. So there's another founder who's an NYU grad who sold his company to Facebook. He didn't have an idea that he wanted to work on at the time. So he said, I want to get really, really smart on agriculture. So instead of actually starting with the problem, he decided that he's just going to get smart on the market, read every single Statista report, went and met every single person that wrote these reports, and started to identify where the problems are and what that future looks like and where a venture that he might eventually build would fit in that space. So again, it's not always starting with the problem and then becoming smart. It might just be starting with the general market you're interested in and then figuring out what problem to solve. Um, that person via NYU, he met with the people that put these reports together? Yeah, and that's, I'll get into that later, but it's a huge advantage that we have being part of an institution like this is that I tell founders this all the time. Instead of saying that I'm a, a founder of X, Y, and Z company, where it automatically within the first line of your email sounds like a sales pitch, instead say, I'm NYU faculty, I'm an NYU alum, I'm an NYU student, I'm working on researching, understanding more about your sector and more about this industry, would you be willing to chat for 15 or 20 minutes? So every single one of my conversations that I get with any big VCs that I look up to or big founders is solely centered around the idea that they want to tell a story and I can try to help them feature that story or I can learn from them. Uh, and it makes it a lot easier to open up doors as opposed to um, treating it like a sales pitch. So I would try that as an approach when you're approaching the market and trying to learn a bit more. So that's exactly how he did it. He was walking around and finding the people that were experts. Uh, so again, that's partly through Google. And then the next tool, which is, what is the media saying about the space that you're operating in? So one big thing that we had done, which is fairly intuitive now, was to put in alerts on Google for certain keywords that if any news articles came out about this issue, send us a digest, right? So search for certain keywords. So if you're working on, so we were working on a content startup. So we wanted to find things uh, around uh, content aggregators. We wanted to find things, updates on Flipboard or Circa or Facebook News. So we made all these things keywords. So every single day, we would get a digest on any big changes in these ventures, any big changes in what's going on in the market, any big changes on the algorithms behind them. So you can do that with news. The, so Google is good enough. I mean, the tool that I have up here is just TechCrunch News, where you can search in TechCrunch News and see kind of what's going on specifically with tech. Right? This is the tool that I have, but don't get in that habit of being in that bubble of only in the tech ecosystem. Uh, so another example, using agriculture, there are several thousands of farmers in the, in the middle of the US who joke and laugh about New York and San Francisco because they think we're building uh, solutions that don't actually fit their problems, right? So if you just get in the habit of only reading tech news that's coming out of bloggers from New York and San Francisco about your issue, you might be very far away from the actual customer you're solving a problem for. 
So use TechCrunch as one tool, but type it into Google News. Again, keep talking to experts, figuring out how things are changing, and this will, again, serve to change your worldview on the entire issue. One other thing about this is that you can actually see what business models are getting funded as well uh, over time. So if uh, you'll see who the big investors are in the space. Uh, so another thing about investors is that we're not just all general investors that will throw money at any startup. A lot of them are now thesis driven because there's a lot of money out there, right? So you want to be able to find the investors that are most uh, suited towards the venture that you're working on. So there's a tool out there that was actually just created by a colleague of mine called VC Finder. If you type in Morgan and VC Finder into Google, you'll find it. And it's an extensive database of every single investor, active investor, and the industries that they focus on. Yeah, it's uh, just type in VC Finder, VC Finder into Google. Uh, you'll find a Medium post about it, and there's a link to that exact spreadsheet. Uh, and I can share it with everybody after that if you can't find it. And you'll find a link to that exact spreadsheet. It has every single investor in there. It doesn't have contact information, uh, but it has the name, the fund, what stage they focus on, and what areas or industries they're excited about. Because again, as you're looking at TechCrunch News, if you see Sequoia Capital or Andreessen Horowitz or the amazing NYU Innovation Venture Fund, you want to know what their focus is. Right? You don't want to just be emailing every single investor and then finding out they've invested in a competitor of yours and now they're taking your entire deck and sharing it with them. Or you don't want to email every investor and they've never actually talked about food delivery before in their life and they only invest in, uh, I don't know, something, e-commerce, something different. Uh, just, we'll pass that. Um, I need everyone to raise their hand if you're going to ask a question. Yeah, we need to get it recorded on the, sorry. Um, I've done this, uh, you know, going to looking for um, investors like in my industry, in my whatever stage. I, this is a question that I have. Like, I see that they invested in, in some so-called my competitors, even if they are not di direct. So I imagine that they will not invest in a company that is a competitor to something that they already invested in. So where am I going to go if these are the ones that are supposed to invest in my industry, but they're already investing in the competitors? So, so I mean, there's enough invest. There's a lot. So you use this VC Finder tool to start, right? Because not all of them have invested in your competitor. Uh, it's in bad taste that they'll invest in a competitor. If they've already invested in someone, they will likely not invest in the same. But that's if it's a direct competitor. If it's an indirect and it's like in the adjacent industry, they might have a thesis on the way they see the world and they're investing in 10 different startups that are going to play in that world. So they might be directly related to one another, but they might not be direct competitors. Uh, so you can talk to them informally and speak to them about your idea and understand if it's a fit for them. Uh, but I can almost guarantee that not every single investor is in that competitor. So it just starts with this process of understanding even what types of funds are excited about it? Um, what types of investors are excited about it, right? If it's a, in, an ag tech startup, are you seeing that most of the funds that have invested in it are East Coast and West Coast investors, or are they more uh, investors based out of St. Louis? Um, so you start to understand this by just reading the press on what's going on in the funding atmosphere, what the business models look like of the companies that are being invested in. Are they subscription platforms? Are they more uh, SaaS platforms? Like what? what is going on in the ecosystem that you can help position yourself as you go forward to. Uh, so you can use this as one tool. Um, building on kind of what we were just talking about with investors, investor behavior is another thing that you can keep track of. So Crunchbase will show you every single investment made, for the most part, every single investment made by an investor. Uh, and you can, this is a really good tool that I used a lot when I was starting my company of finding out your competitor, what stage of investment are they at? Are they at a B or C or D, which is it's not uh, completely relevant and not so important, but it is in terms of understanding the progress they've made and what milestones they might have hit at each of those stages, uh, how valuation changed, what they raised, who they raised from, uh, and understanding the behavior where it's moving. Is everything moving away from uh, meal delivery kit subscription packages since Blue Apron's IPO. Is everything moving away or moving more towards it? So you can see kind of how industry is shifting and how business models are changing over time if you keep a track of investor behavior. And all these are a lot of things to keep track of, but as you do it, you can start building a habit of 
maybe you have a digest once a week for two hours where you go through these tools and understand kind of what's out there um, and have a database for yourself to just start keeping track of some of these things too. Uh, I don't need to talk about it. I mean, you can buzz Sumo and a couple of other blogs. You can see what bloggers are talking about, influential sites, influential people, who you can work with, who you can speak to. I've kind of said that a ton of times, but this is another tool you can use. Uh, this is a really good one, Product Hunt. Uh, how many people in here are familiar with Product Hunt? Great, well, that's good. So Product Hunt is a great place to just drop an initial MVP or prototype or even something a little bit more public of what you're working on. Uh, generally what I found is that the audience isn't so harshly critical. They might be more critical in terms of these features are interesting, this is what we like. It's a good way to start testing things out with your early customer base if you believe that your customer base is on here. Uh, and getting feedback from the tech community and other people that are builders and have empathy with what you're going through also to understand what they like about your product, where it can improve, uh, it's a good way to get early traction. Uh, you can put it out there and kind of also, if you're not dropping your product on there, you can observe what new products are coming out. So you can do searches, again, like food delivery, if we're looking at that, and see which products are trending over time. Uh, what's new in the market? What else are people putting out there that might have not made it to the Google News 35th page, but and now it's on here? Um, you can also maybe get some collaborations on here. So you can see what other people are working on in the past and maybe it didn't work out or maybe it failed. So are they working on anything new? Um, Producthunt.com, yeah. I believe it's .com, yeah. <clears throat> this we touched on already. LinkedIn, while people have their own opinions of it, is still one of the best resources to get in touch with experts. Again, we go back to that former not the sales pitch, but more the, I am an NYU student, I'm an NYU faculty, I'm working on a paper, I'm working on doing more research on this, I would like to learn more about this space, I would love to profile your experiences, um, I would love to just buy you a coffee, and there's enough people on LinkedIn, you might go for every five you email, you'll probably maybe get one person respond favorably, but I would recommend just keep trying it. Uh, this is how I've done um, kind of everything with my startups and personal stuff. So, and even over here, we use it a lot uh, if we want to meet with other VCs. So I, I, I would definitely recommend using this as much as possible to figure out your focus area, who the experts are in this space, um, and getting some face time with them too. Okay, market sizing. So this is uh, the fun part. So one thing that I think is really interesting about market sizing as we've worked through this with a couple of different startups here is that your market sizing doesn't always need to be based off of how it exists today. It doesn't need to be uh, we're looking at comparable sets of data of other companies that are operating today and that means that's what our market size is. You can be, so there's three ways of looking at this. You can say I'm a disruptor and the exact market that I have now, I'm gonna take over uh, that market. And this is what that market size equates to. That you can use off of existing data. You can look at what people are willing to pay for a service, how many people are paying for that service currently, and what does that market size adopt and equate to. Another interesting way of presenting this, if you don't have that data, or you think what service you're offering into the ether and into the world is something that doesn't exist right now, and it's a little bit different, which you think Uber, back when it was presenting its business, it's now, I don't know, it's, it's something, the valuation, I don't know what it is, the most recent valuation, but it's something ridiculous. But when they pitched it at first, they weren't just going based off of what current taxis were making. They were saying they're going to now expand the market, make ride sharing more accessible, and as a result, the market, once they've had penetration in that market, will look like this. So you can be a market expander, not a market disruptor. So that's another interesting way of thinking about it. Does your service expand the market to something ginormous that other people would want to be a part of? whether that's partners, clients, customers, investors. And then the final one is, are you more prophetic? Right? So you might say that you're working on an artificial intelligence startup that's going to help make data storage uh, and data processing a bit easier. Uh, right now, the market for this is smaller, but as artificial intelligence and machine learning picks up, there's going to be a higher need for that, and that's why we think our startup is the most viable, and this is the market size. Right? It's not really your startup that's being the expander, but it's a series of other forces that are at work that are making this more viable. Right? So another example would be mobile phone penetration. So back when uh, kind of mobile phone penetration was increasing exponentially, 
were apps and other startups that depended on, on mobile phones, like the Facebook Messenger app, when they started talking about it. Right, so they might not talk about the Facebook Messenger app in terms of the one that's expanding. They might talk about it more prophetic, that we'll have more downloads as more mobile phones come into play. So these are just three different ways of thinking about it. Uh, Sarah, I think we have one question. Um, for my question is for the expander. Would, be an, would um, online shopping be an example for expander, like at, at its time, online shopping? Yeah, at its time, yeah, it could have been. Uh, well, I mean, it's a little bit trickier with that one. Like, so the internet was already around, and you can right. say that retail brands, you're not technically making online shopping a trend. It probably already existed, and as a retail brand, now you're taking advantage of that. So that might be more prophetic, gotcha. right? As okay. more people have access to the internet, they'll shop more, and that's why my startup will be part of this increased market size in the future. So if you're looking at online shopping as a whole, when the internet first came around and mobile shopping was not that big, the total sales might have equated to a billion dollars in a year. Now, it's probably blown past that as mobile penetration and internet penetration increases globally. Uh, so that's one way of looking at it. But that would be more prophetic as Expander. Gotcha. Um, can you provide me with another example for Expander? Sure. So we're working with a startup now. Um, and we were actually having this conversation that I won't uh, talk about the specific one, but. I think I talk about the specific one. So they are working on destigmatizing, and actually, she's an awesome founder. And one day, I think hopefully you guys will all be able to hear from her. But she's working on destigmatizing uh, mental therapy. And it's called My Wellbeing, so I think you guys should all look her up. Uh, but she's working on destigmatizing it in terms of how can we, I'm sorry, it's got disconnected. Um, how can, so right now, the way the market equates to is, She's looking at how many people are spending on mental uh, therapy right now and mental wellness. But she's also saying that there's a very big stigma around it, where a lot of people don't feel comfortable doing it. There's not as many services. It's not as available for them to find uh, these services right now. So how can we make that more accessible? So she's doing content. She's working with different types of clients. She's working with businesses to make that more accessible. So her goal is to expand the mental wellness space. Right? So the current market size, how much is being spent right now, she thinks that's just the tip of the iceberg. As more people realize that this is something essential, the market continues to get bigger, and she's paving the way for that to happen through content, through making it accessible, things like that. So that would be an example of an expander. Uh, and then we can think of more and chat offline, too. Thank you so much. Uh, Okay, sorry. Um, I know. I, I, I think that in my case, at least, it's kind of a, the intersection between disruptor and expander. Yeah, that's fine. I, it's yeah. fine. Whatever, whatever you believe tells the best story and is the most realistic for what your venture is. The, the worst thing is if you come into an investor or a client and say, my market's $50 trillion, and I'm basing it off of 18-year-olds globally. Right? Again, it's like the depth of understanding. So you can say, if you have a view of what the world looks like five to 10 years from now, you can very clearly state and be a, a prophet in that space because now you're a thought leader. Mm -hmm. So that's why everything that we just talked up about until now is more developing that sense so that you have the authority to say, this is where the market's headed, this is why the market size is gonna look like that, and this is where my startup's gonna play in the same time. So it might be, between disruptor, it might be between expander, it might be between prophetic. You could do all three at once, mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. If all those forces are working in your favor, so if we go after other examples, there might be, I don't know, I, I don't know, so I'm, this is a lack of knowledge, but I don't know who came first, but whether it was Juno, Via, Uber, Lyft, who the first player yeah. was, but someone might say, let's just say it was Lyft. Disruptor. Right. Let's just say it was Lyft, right? They might be the disruptor. Yeah. So someone like Via might be coming in and saying, we're not only going to disrupt the New York City Tax and Limousine Commission, we think that Uber is doing things wrong, we're going to disrupt them. Uh, we're now going to expand the market by making it more accessible to do ride sharing the way Uber hasn't. And they're going to take the same prophetic views that Uber has in the world with mobile phone penetration, with more metropolitan cities, more people needed to tra transport, things like that. So that all kind of works in, okay. in favor. Makes sense. 
how big your competitor need to be in order to be this to be called a disruption? Because what if there is something out there, but it's still very small? Maybe it's still in the better phase and they're still checking, but you know they're there. I and you have maybe something better. So when does it consider to be a disruption? Well, I don't think there, there doesn't, it's whatever is worth your time. It doesn't matter if a competitor is not really a multi-billion dollar company right now. You can be building a lifestyle business and that's amazing. Right, if, um, for example, Chipotle, I was listening to his How I Built This podcast the other day, and it wasn't about, he just wanted to build one taco shop and disrupt the way other taco shops in Colorado were working. And that was the view, that was the entire vision. He wanted to use that to support himself as he built a Michelin-rated star restaurant. And so he could just be disrupting the regular taco chain by saying, I'm gonna try something new, and I'm gonna steal their revenue and their market share. That's fine, right, it doesn't have to be, I think that's the biggest problem with kind of the ecosystem we're in now is that everybody thinks that in order for a business to be successful, it has to be A, raising venture financing, and B, has to have a multi-billion dollar valuation, and it has to scale over two to three years. And then there's many businesses that work very well without that and have continued to disrupt again and again. Uh, but we'll, we'll touch on the competition piece again. I'm gonna go through kind of how we size these uh, logistically and a little bit more mathematically, but we can definitely come back to some of this. So, this is the example of what I was saying, where people come in and say, this is market's gonna be really huge, and we are gonna take it over, and this is why you should give us money. Nobody buys this, um, right? So you can come in and say it's a $26 billion market, but I'm gonna do math on the back end, and I'm gonna actually go and read Statista and read news and see where your comparable companies are getting funded at, find out exactly what your market size looks like. Uh, we actually had a company recently that did that, right? And I'm gonna come out with your market size the same exact way that you did or didn't and see if it makes sense, right? There might be market sizes that I'll wrap my head around, but I also have a specific criteria for how I'm investing. A venture investment, venture investor is looking at an investment very differently than a typical, like an angel investor might, or a bank might, or a, a, a microfinance fund, or sorry, an impact fund. There's different types of people look at different types of market sizes. So just have the logic and the understanding behind this on why you're doing your market sizing a certain way. Uh, so how can we start to do that? So T I'm gonna be using three terms. There's TAM, SOM, and SAM. Right, so your TAM is your total available market. That's the big number that you're gonna be working towards over the five to 10 years that you're working on this venture. Right, it's your grand vision on how big can this be? Whether you're an expander or disruptor, prophetic, how big will this market be at scale? Um, so the, the way we look at these numbers aren't real, but again, we're going down that food delivery cycle and this, the most easiest way of doing this to start with is just that top-down approach of saying, I'm focusing on overall, again, this is very wide customer archetypes. So I'm contradicting what I said in the beginning, but it's fine for this example, otherwise we'd be here all day. But your customers would be a certain description over here. So you would start with, uh, for food delivery, you're saying 200 million Americans between 18 and 65 years old. Um, the, on average, they're uh, 10 days a year, they're getting lunch delivered. So how many, what's the frequency of those people actually getting lunch delivered? Uh, and how much are they spending on average for lunch, right? So that would equate to this $20 billion a year total available market. If you hit scale, if that was your customer, if you continue to seize that market share from those $10, you can present it this way. Some investors are okay with this way. I prefer if you told me your market size based off of the percentage that you're gonna take from this. So they're spending $10, does that make sense? They're spending $10 per meal, but what's your revenue share of that? If you're taking 10%, then your total market size is two billion, not 20 billion. Um, I prefer it that way, I've heard other investors prefer it that way. Show whatever makes sense to you, and you can tell the story, uh, and they both work. So your total available market is where you're focusing five to 10 years out. So your analysis basically suggests that you're going after the gross profit, not actually how right. much is spent in the exactly. industry. Yeah, right. Um, the second one that we're focusing on, which is a, sub a smaller subset of that total available market, is your SAM, which is your serviceable available market 
and that's your total market available to be serviced. So who would buy your solution now, given your existing business model? Who will take a half-baked product as opposed to a fully fleshed out product right now from a small team with no money? So what are you able to service of this market? Right, so if I said 18 to 65 million Americans, maybe I'm able to service the entire Northeast. Uh, or maybe I'm able to service people only with smartphone because I'm not going web-based right now. Uh, or maybe I'm able to only service the iPhone because I'm going iOS first. So what does that serviceable uh, market look like that you're focusing on? And then you just completely, you whittle down that 20 billion to now make sense of what this is. The last one, which I think, so again, this is your, maybe your year's two to five year plan as you scale up uh, and how you're looking at it. So your TAM would be your five to 10, your SAM would be your two to five, and then I think this is what's really important in telling that story and how this all evolves is your serviceable obtainable market. So now you're based in NYU, you're gonna focus maybe on the first five boroughs or you might only focus on downtown Manhattan. So what does that market look like? So this paints a really good image, again, as a thought leader and as someone strategic in year one, this is what I wanna grab of the market. Year two, this is what I'm gonna grab. This is how my product evolves. This is how my team evolves. This is how my financing evolves. And you paint a very nice picture and a story for me that I know that you're being strategic and thinking about how the future is gonna evolve around your product. Then finally, you go into TAM, and that shows me that you truly are the disruptor, that you're working on building something so uh, kind of disruptive that's gonna grab the entire market away from any existing competitors. So on your pitch decks, if you guys are thinking about this on what you present, I would start with your show your total available market um, as the main kind of hook. Uh, and then when you're telling your story and you're talking about this at a product roadmap level, one thing that helps in terms of communicating the story is building your product roadmap to show what piece of the market you're gonna grab at every phase of the company and how much funding you need to do that uh, and what sort of hires you need to do that and how your uh, entire company is gonna evolve over that period to grab the new pieces. So this is just, a, again, a description of how total available market is captured. We'll share this deck with you. Uh, serviceable botanical market, and there you go. So planning, investing strategically, uh, I won't go too deep in this. We can open up uh, for questions in a second, but I wanted to go into more into, we'll talk about that after. I wanted to go into competition and how you can start thinking about this a little bit. This diagram doesn't work. So every single deck that I used to see was had this two by two grid diagram. Um, which shows, uh, it doesn't work. It's, um, it, it, again, it doesn't show a depth of understanding that you know how the market actually looks and where it works. This is, can be easily doctored where you show your, uh, your two positive qualities on the, the upper Y axis and the, the further right X axis um, and how you're always gonna be in the top right quadrant and everybody else is in the bottom left and this is how you're gonna take over the market. Nobody buys it. Every single investor just skips right over this page and doesn't really look at it. And it also shows kind of like an immaturity in the founder and their understanding of how the ecosystem actually works. Uh, I know this is the only tool that usually has been made accessible in decks that we've seen online, but I think you can evolve this um, as you look at it. So to give you the other tool, so you don't, this, I know this looks more noisy uh, and confusing, but this works a lot better in terms of even if you're not putting it in a pitch deck, but just for your own internal understanding, I would build this. So this goes into your question earlier about direct competitors versus indirect competitors. The way I would think about this is who is competing for your customer's attention and time uh, other than yourself? And like, what are your alternative things that they can use? What are the substitutes that they have for your product right now? So Limber Activewear, I believe is an NYU company um, and they had an active wear clothing line, I believe. And so if we're looking at, at, at this, uh, I'm going to load all of them. If we're looking at this one, the way you would treat, it's called a pedal diagram, and it was started by Steve Blank. Uh, but you want to populate each of these segments to understand who the players are in the space. So each of your pedals are going to be one of those pieces that are competing for your customer's time. So if I go back with the, um, the Uber, the Lyft, the Via example, if I'm Uber and I'm sitting in the middle, 
some of my competitors in one might be other car sharing, ride sharing services, right? So that'll be Lyft via all these. It would be traditional players, right? The New York City Taxi Limousine Commission. What regulations do they face? What do their stakeholders look like? What does their growth trajectory look like? Who are their customers? They're very different from the Via and the Lyft competitor bracket. Then you look at public transportation, right? People can just use the train and the subways and bus and other ways of getting around. Then you can just look at the very non-obvious one, which is how do I get people that are going to actually just walk this ride to now take an Uber um, pool? Right? So you want to look at every single alternative for your service and populate them here and figure out if you're focusing on that specific niche, which niche are you focusing in early on, and who are the other big players that are competing for your time and attention. Uh, this is valid, but I don't need to spend too much time on this. This is your positioning statement in terms of who are you solving the problem for? Who's your target customer? What is the category that you're working towards? What are the benefits and value propositions you're offering them? Uh, and how are you offering it to them? What are the differentiators? I would make this the first slide of your deck every single time. Uh, this just tells a really good story. So these are just a couple of interesting images that I thought would be fun. But <laughs> so advantages arise from better differentiated technology, uh, the gun versus the sword, changes in government regulations, so cannabis, uh, better understanding of newer shifting buyer needs and preferences, and the new industries or growing segments, which is the expander market that we were talking about earlier. We've talked about the business model canvas and how you're going to prioritize and invest in time uh, on the certain value propositions and customer segments and, and prioritizing those. You also don't want to stay limited to a certain business model. So just where I'm saying that we're going to focus on the initial niche at first, give you a couple of examples of companies that have started off in a specific niche and then scaled over time. So I don't need to tell you the rest of the story, but where Amazon started, um, where Facebook started, uh, and where Uber started was for the high-end luxury market where the quote from Travis was, it was really a lifestyle company. It was about us and a hundred of our friends to be able to push a button and get around San Francisco like ballers. Right? So that was the initial view for Uber. He understood his customer well uh, and maybe never adopted it over the years. Uh, so that is one other thing to think about. Now, I mentioned this earlier, but you can book time with any of us at any point, and you can spend uh, as much time in this space as you'd like as well. And there's several kind of resources, classes, boot camps. Um, we bring in external speakers. We have pitch competitions. You can meet with coaches and mentors. So there's a ton of resources here that you can use. So feel free to leverage those anytime at all times. But I would love to, is there anybody in the audience that's working on a startup? And is there anybody willing to stand up here and talk about their startup? All right, you guys. Someone's got it. Someone has to. You guys had to get in the habit of being able to talk about your startups publicly. All right, we have one volunteer. Oh, yeah? All right, great. Perfect. And then and you after also. Um, yeah, please. Thanks. Um, Thank and it's a friendly audience. There's no money involved. It's all I'm canal. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so one thing I was thinking what we can do is let's build, uh, maybe why don't you talk us through the customer that you're built. You tell us about your venture, what sure. customer you're thinking about, and then we can help fill out that adjacent competitors. So I think everybody should get involved in this, right? So let's try to make this startup a success. So let's figure out what the pedal diagram looks like and who the customers might be for her segment, so we can fill out maybe at least three of those customer archetype profiles. So we don't know anything about our venture right now, so let's see if we can run with this. Hi, everyone. So my name is Britt, and I am the co-founder of Food Period. Um, we want women to have better periods, and so we're focused on creating organic food-based products to help support women's menstrual cycles. Great, OK. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's called Food Period. Food Period. So can you tell us who you think your customer is right now? Yeah, so we've spoken to a ton of women. Um, and it's, it's kind of changed our vision of who we thought it would initially be for. Um, but what we've learned in our customer discovery phase is that 
our um, ideal customer is a woman um, in her late 20s to early 30s. She's working, she's super busy, um, but she has period-related problems. So she has to have some sort of pain point with her period. But instead of it just being something that's um, really extreme, like polycystic ovarian syndrome or endometriosis, it can be as simple as um, hormonal acne around her period or um, really bad cramps that would make her interested in something a product like this. Um, she also needs to be um, kind of inclined toward a healthier lifestyle and more wellness-based lifestyle, not um, using pharmaceuticals as her first line of defense. And so um, other activities that we felt were running tangentially in her life are maybe she goes to yoga or she takes a spin class, um, she like tries to drink less, like these kind of things. So sure. just kind of leading a healthy lifestyle. Okay. Um, so... She sneakily already gave us two of the pedals, but can anybody volunteer and say who might be in these competitive pedals? What are some of the broad buckets that we might look at on who's competing for the product? Yeah. Um, so other providers of, of remedies for some of these pain points, so I think one would be over-the-counter uh, pain meds, Advil, Tylenol, et cetera. Perfect. So pharma would be one pedal, which is perfect. Mm -hmm. What else? Oh, sorry. I don't think I can do that. Um, what would be the other competitors besides pharma? Another pedal of that diagram. She mentioned it and she alluded to it in her proposal. Other organic medication, you know. Great. I'm always going to the health food stores to find stuff. Great. So it's not pharma, it might be supplements and organic, uh, like not traditional oh, food, but might be vitamins or things like that. And then she also, also mentioned something else that's competing for time that might, she might not take organic food. So what else is this uh, woman looking for that might help? Right. So like lifestyle adjustments might be a third pile, right? So is it, does exercise help improve? Um, I don't know much about this market, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, does that help improve the situation, decrease menstrual, that's what you're talking about, decrease menstrual camps? Yeah. Um, so you have already have populated three petals. Uh, is there other ones that you guys can think of? Um, period subscription boxes that provide products. Period subscription boxes that already provide um, products, like PMS package and stuff like that. Right, okay, perfect. Um, so I think like that, I'm not sure if you were thinking about it that way already, but this starts to help focus on what the entire industry looks like and how you can start to build it out. But then on your customer segment, so what were you thinking about your customer segment for the, how are you going to start rolling this out and focusing on it? Um, so, it oh yeah, yeah. sorry. Um, so we were thinking kind of the low hanging fruit for us um, are women who are suffering from like more serious um, period related problems like polycystic ovarian syndrome or endometriosis. Each of those affects one in 10 American women and that number is considered conservative because these, sim uh, these um, conditions often go undiagnosed. So um, often the only, um, available pharmaceutical for a lot of these women is the birth control pill. And uh, actually 60% of women take the birth control pill for non-pharmaceutical or non-contraceptive um, purposes. And so that was kind of our first customer segment that we were really interested in because they have a real problem and um, they're going to have to do something for that problem. Uh, and so we're thinking that that would be the first step it's to amazing. go after. Can we get a huge round of applause? <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one other thing too that's interesting is that if that's the initial market that they're focusing on is what are the channels that they're going to be using to reach that customer, right? So she's saying that females globally are focused with this issue. She's focusing on the United States and she's offering organic food products in what cities or regions or how is the, what channel are they going to use to actually deliver that food? Is it going to be retail based? Is it mail based, subscription based? So looking at the entire business model, that will also decide what geography you focus on, what age group you focus on. Um, so it's looking at that in your customer archetype. So that is the jobs to be done and the pains and the gains of how you're offering it to them. That all changes based off of your archetype profile. So that helps. Uh, is there anybody else who wants to share their venture? Uh, 
parrot. So just start with like the problem I'm trying to solve. Or? Yeah, sure. So does anyone here live in a building that doesn't have a doorman? Used to, like a majority of people. So one of the problems that we're trying to solve is how do you uh, share keys amongst people without a doorman trying to, um, like digitally? And so one of the things is trying to use the blockchain to be able to exchange keys in a uh, secure and fast and efficient way. And that's like the initial product. And then long term would be just an overall exchange for intangible items using like the blockchain. Mm. OK. So who wants to populate his pedal? <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Sarah. We're talking about like regular household keys, like the thing you open the door, right? Are we talking about wallet keys? So the value is what? You're getting the keys. If someone needs keys to get into the apartment, right. then they can transfer that from one to another. Correct. Or if you have a delivery guy coming or a plumber or someone, then you'd be able to exchange the key. You have a written you know, verification of who it is right. securely, but it's not publicly available. It would just be a private key for okay. who it comes. Great. <laughs> so smart locks for sure all the existing big companies home products are developing smart locks that could do this so these are only for digital keys correct okay great oh. um so there are ways like with physical keys now i know they have services where you like at my coffee shop they have a place where you can like put the key in and there's some code that someone has to type in to to get the key. So there are ways like that to share keys right, right okay. now. Uh, analog strategies like bodega, lawn, you know, laundromat, just leaving a key with, some, with a local business that you frequent and trust. OK. I think this is only for digital keys, though, right. not so physical just, keys. But, yeah, the goal would be to make it. Sorry. To make it what? The goal would be to have it be a digital reader so that you could install a new like door lock that then you could just use your phone to either unlock it or scan it. OK, great. Um, so let's go into the, uh, the customer types a little bit. Who do you think your customer is right now? Pretty much anyone in Manhattan that doesn't have a uh, doorman. Or um, most likely it would be people between ages of 18 to you know 30 who have probably more interest in blockchain related technologies. but. Uh, I guess more prophetically, uh, as people become more interested in uh, blockchain becomes more sure. mainstream, then people will probably become a little bit more open to it. Cool. Um, but, um, there are a lot of old buildings, and in, in, I mean, I, I used to live, live in, in like here in the East Village, um, and the building was very old. And they didn't have anything digital. It was like everything like very, you know, like old times. So there are a lot of people who li live in this kind of buildings. So it has to be um, not only someone who is interested in that, also that like they're living in the right building that you can use it. Mm -hmm. Because the majority are very old. Um, great. Can we get a round of applause? Yeah. Sharing his idea. Um, so I actually, what, what's also interesting about that and building on what you said is that if you, you can't necessarily, the total available market is uh, everybody that lives in the city and has keys without a doorman. But I think in the beginning, if you're building on the blockchain and it's going to be digital keys, you might be focused on people that have more of a technological bent, right? So does that presuppose any sort of income bracket if they've installed digital well, keys? Like <laughs> right, so you're already in that, right? Okay, so you have that. Um, are they in a building like you're saying? Is there a certain... Uh, year that the building was built in so that they're actually allowed to put those types of locks in. So then that narrows the types of buildings you're focusing on and the neighborhoods you're focusing on. Uh, and uh, both, even besides the income bracket, the technological bent. So is there a certain level of education that they've needed in order to be able to use the blockchain or are you going to make this super accessible for them? So I think those are just some of the other areas you guys can consider. But I uh, think that's it on my end. But does anybody have any questions or things that they'd like to talk about earlier, from earlier? In the presentation? Yeah. Sorry. So when you're actually building the pedal diagram, do you include 
like which one of those pedals is the competitor or the potential channel because it was kind of difficult to see from there. Sure, sure. Yeah, so you will include the so you will include uh, your competitors here. But what we're trying to say is that it's not the two by two diagram where it's just completely two dimensional and you just think uh, these are all competing in some general way. This is more us trying to think and evolve how we look at our competitors and what areas of focus are they competing for, right? So for example, if this is a, 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 a brand that's building a fitness line of clothes, does, and they're producing content, do gyms and fitness programs produce content that cannibalize and compete against that? Um, if they're going after, if it's monitoring their fitness activity through those clothes that they're wearing, what other substitutes do they have? That's the fitness and the wearables, right? So these are all indirect competitors. There's some directs. Not so much channels were we built on here. It's more who's competing for attention of time uh, for your product. So again, it's like a substitute. Uh, so if we go into the Uber example, a substitute is just walking. Uh, so that's how you want to look at the pedal diagram and populate it. And you, this will all evolve as you talk to the customers and build those customer archetypes. So if you just go to them and say, tell me when, when you get to the problem and the frustration that they're talking about and you ask them, how do you solve this now? You'll hear that. So if it's like, how do you get from point A to point B? What are your frustrations with that? Sometimes I walk. Sometimes I take the train. Sometimes I take my bike. Sometimes I take an Uber. Sometimes I take a yellow cab. Sometimes I take the bus. So right there, you'll start to hear different ways people are solving these problems. That's a very basic granular example, but you'll start to hear other solutions that people are using to solve that problem. Anybody else? Great. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. And again, feel free to use us.